Well, good day to everybody. It is April 2nd. Today is First Chronicles chapter 6, somewhat of a long chapter. It's the only chapter we have. We've got more genealogy. Um, this is, this is a, an important chapter because uh, what we get are the descendants of Levi. And it's obvious that the number of verses that the chronicler uses to uh, go into the descendants of Levi tells us how important the Levites are to the chronicler. Remember, this is post-exilic. Um, this is written, we're pretty sure the chronicler lives in Persia, was Babylon, where he was in exile. Uh, he's writing from that, from, from the perspective of exile, but uh, some of his people have returned to the Holy Land and Jerusalem. So he has a concern about the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the covenant and the worship of God through uh, the rebuilding of the temple and uh, the restor restoring the city of Jerusalem. And so uh, obviously the Levites and the priests are important to that. So the chronicler is going to spend some time on this. Now, Oh, we have to remember, if we're going to recall our history back there, Moses in the, in the wilderness with the law. All priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. The priests have specific duties uh, in reference to the temple and offering of sacrifices. The Levites who are not priests are, for lack of a better term, temple assistants. There's all kinds of other things that they do but they do not offer the sacrifices. They don't do the priestly. They don't have the priestly functions. Okay, so um, you get this genealogy. Uh, the section is divided into two parts. Verses one through 53 uh, is the genealogy of the Aaronite priests and other Levites, um, and, uh, and also the settlements of the Levites. Um, you also, well, you get in, I'm sorry, let me back up. I'm confusing here. The second section, 54 through 81, is focuses on the settlements of the Levites, where they settled. Remember, geography is important to the chronicler. Um, so um, it's interesting that um, uh, the way he orders the, the genealogies uh, by family and clans, and he uses military terminology. This is, we've seen this before. Remember when Moses conducts a census in the wilderness to count the people? They may basically want to count the able-bodied men who are able to do battle, and that they are all settled uh, in military-style organization, if you will. We would, we would probably say today, you know, have them encamped and settled by companies and regiments and corps, However, whatever military terminology we're familiar with today, that we use today, if you can think in that terms, this is what's going on here. Um, it's interesting that in the genealogies of Manasseh and Ephraim, there's no mention of any stay in Egypt. Now, we're told that they were, came, came out of Egypt. Um, but uh, it, it might be that we've got, by this time, some settling of other folks uh, who are not part of, not part of the original tribes, hard to say. Um, so it's a little iffy as to how to understand what's going on with that. Um, you also get, um, uh, in reference to the narrative about Joshua, which you get in the book of Exodus, um, Joshua, we're told, was born in Egypt, right? That's what we find out, and he later goes, leads people into the promised land. None of this is mentioned by the author of Chronicles. This, for whatever reason, is left out. Um, Joshua is presented here as already established in the land, and uh, he doesn't have the conqueror role that we saw in the book of Joshua. And in fact, his leadership in the conquest is omitted. Now, you always have to be careful when you try to get inside the head of an ancient writer. When you ask why would the chronicler exclude Joshua? Joshua is a pretty important figure. He takes over for Moses, right? And uh, he leads the people and he seems to be pretty faithful. In fact, uh, he seems to be one of the few characters uh, so far who doesn't have that much to remember in the way of negatives, okay? Not that he was perfect, but he certainly 
doesn't have the kind of slip ups that they, David has with Bathsheba, with Moses, and he does at times. So it's just interesting the chronicler would remove, would not count Joshua. Now we can try and get into his head, psychoanalyze him too much and say, well, Joshua is not important or he's trying to cover up the fact that Joshua was important. I think we need to be careful about those kinds of things, those kinds of conclusions. I think it may be that, that uh, this is not just his purposes. The chronicler wants to focus on the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the importance of the temple, the priests, the importance of, of, of an ideal monarchy being established. Um, not the one we saw in first and second Kings that headed toward disaster. So he's focused on that. So he's focused on the land itself. So maybe Joshua just doesn't figure in. So we wanna be careful. Uh, one of the things that I often think about in writing, uh, when I write, there's things that I, because of space and other things, there's things I have to exclude, even though I think they might be important, I make judgments as to what's important for what I want to write as opposed to what I need to write as opposed to, to other information. So it could be just that the chronicler, this just doesn't figure in. I mean, you know, we could always ask the question of other books, you know, why does Luke, uh, talk about the shepherds, but not the Magi. Why does Matthew talk about the Magi and not the shepherds? It could very well be that maybe um, Luke didn't know about the Magi, or maybe that was just a story that wasn't absolutely critical for the story of Jesus he was wanting to tell, the, the, the aspects and specifics. So let's be careful about getting too far into the heads of these uh, long dead writers. It could just be that this is not what is significant for the chronicler. What is significant is the tribe of Levi, their descendants, and hopefully they will continue as the temple is rebuilt after the exile. And they will, unlike Levites, uh, many Levites that we read about in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, they will be faithful to the covenant. They will not be idol worshipers. They will not be idolaters. So that's really, really important. Okay, friends, so that's where we are. Tomorrow we will continue in 1 Chronicles chapter 7 and 8. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you again for the gift of this wonderful day, for the many blessings we have received. And as you have so blessed us in this day, may we in all that we say and all that we do bless others in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. Hasta mañana.